So the first mega trend is the issue of population, population growth. But it's not just about uh, growth, it's about the divergence and how the demography is changing across uh, uh, the world. Uh. So what we see is a growing population worldwide, but it's mainly in Africa and Asia, and it is going at a slower rate as, a, uh, as we grow more prosperous uh, across the world. We have an aging issue, which is very, very important for Europe, uh, because we will not have an increasing population in, in absolute terms, but we will have an aging population in, in, uh, within that number. Uh. Um, and that has implications for us because as an aging population with a reduced workforce, we're likely to see increased migration coming into Europe. We're likely to see that coming from countries which may um, have growing populations and therefore people will want to move to have economic and social opportunities elsewhere in the world. Uh. Now we know today that migration is a big debate in Europe and uh, uh, when you look at these trends it could become an even bigger debate. And, and, and just one of the main findings is this 43% growth of the global population by 2050 compared with 2010. Uh. These are big, big numbers. Huh? And what does it mean for the environment? Well, we do know that there's a relationship between population growth and environmental impacts. And therefore, it's likely with this uh, growth in population that we will have even in more pressure on use of natural resources. And for Europe, that sh should tell us that we should really think hard about how efficient we are in using resources and how technologically innovative we are in finding substitutes for, for resources. Eh? It can be through nanotechnologies, it can be through various, uh, various means. Eh? The second megatrend is about living in an urban world where we see that uh, the big number is that 67% uh, of the world's population are expected to be living in cities by uh, 2050. Um, we know that if you uh, develop compact cities, then you end up in your most sustainable kind of uh, urbanization. Uh, but in Europe, we've seen over the last 20 years an increasing sprawl in urban areas. The idea of suburban areas, peri-urban areas, um, it's not a compact approach that we've had in Europe for the last 20 years. Eh? But if you look around the world at the major capital cities, then most of them are uh, located on the coast for very good reasons, because they've been developed in line with trade and uh, economic developments of the last 200 years. Eh? If climate change, as we expect it to happen, is going to result in sea level rises, how are we going to adapt these cities? Are we going to build big walls? Are we going to move? If you move from Barcelona uh, down the coast, you're not exactly able to move into places that are resilient for uh, development because they have been already degraded to some extent with the, the tourism development of the last uh, 20, 30, 40 years. Huh? Um, so the choices that we make here are rather, um, are rather profound. Huh? But when we do make the choices, we should be thinking about urban design in a much more, in a very different way than we thought about it for the last, uh, for the last century. Huh? This um, trend is about health, and uh, it refers back to uh, what I was saying about the, the global burden of disease, 25% coming from um, environmental causes. Eh? But this issue of non-communicable diseases overtaking communicable diseases the next global megatrends are things that you may be more familiar with in the sense of um, the idea of growth and economic growth. Um, the predictions from the OECD and others is that there will be um, a 300% increase in, in uh, economic growth as measured by GDP by 2050. Yeah? Um, we know the relationship between growth and resource use is, is, is quite clear, the correlation. Um, so the implications for natural resources and environmental impacts are quite clear from that. Um, what would be interesting, though, is to think a little bit about how do we want to measure a good economy? And GDP has been there for 60 years. We invented it, uh, we implemented it in 1953 as a basis for understanding how to pay back to America the debt of the Marshall Plan. That was the, that was the reasoning that brought it to a kind of, um, to a, a system as it is. Um, it's developed way beyond that, but it's not a system for, I think, measuring what it is we want to understand to be an, e a, a, an economic performance of the type that marries together economic growth objectives with environmental objectives, with social objectives. Eh? G 
GDP was never designed for that, uh, but we haven't managed to find an alternative in the 60 years. Eh? Despite the fact that the people who wrote the system for GDP said that this does not include enough about social aspects and it does not include environmental externalities, so somebody should do some work on it. Eh? And 60 years later, we're still, we're still doing it. Eh? The next three trends are environmental. And we're an environment agency, and so these ones are much more directly relevant to what it is, uh, we're talking about here. And um, I, I just want to bring out two points here. One is the issue of meat consumption um, and the idea that we use five times more land, but also it's seven times more CO2 per kilogram of meat compared with per kilogram of vegetable um, cereal. Um, and then the issue of bioenergy. I mean... It's probably one of the most regrettable decisions that's been made in the last uh, 10, 15 years to, to um, look for 10% of transport fuel coming from bioenergy sources. Eh? Um, because it's created market distortions and investments that have been uh, really misallocated, I should say. Um, and if we look at the go back to the population trends, the urbanization trends, and the issue of food, and how it is we're going to uh, produce food in the next, uh, in the next decades. Eh? I think one issue that has to be rather clear is that there shouldn't be any bioenergy coming from, uh, uh, from, uh, fr fr from food. Eh? <clears throat> Here we see uh, something that I think you'll be uh, quite aware of with respect to the, uh, the climate change. And, the, and this graph just tries to show by having in 2013, much more dark red and purple than in 2001, that the science of the, IP, the, the, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change is telling us that the situation is accelerating for us. Eh? Um, there's still many uncertainties in the science, um, but there is an increasing understanding that these systems of production and consumption that we have cannot be sustained beyond the next uh, 20, 30 years. Europe has been very good at environmental policy because Europe has been able to control environmental policy. If you look at the trends that we're observing, many of them are outside of our influence. Many of them are outside of our knowledge. Um, and that makes it for a, a, a very different dynamic for Europe in the coming 40 years. Eh? Because we don't control, we don't influence, and we don't understand or have the knowledge necessary to uh, manage things for the next 40 years in the way that we've been, we've been very successfully able to manage things in the, last, in the past 40 years. Eh?